Cox can help make your home smarter and your life easier. Now you can use your Contour voice remote to connect to your home life cameras so you can view them right on your TV screen using simple voice commands. That makes it easy to keep tabs on what's happening around your home right from your couch. Need to keep an eye on the kids when they're playing outside? Just say, show me my backyard camera into your Cox voice remote and watch them while you're in the house. And if you're waiting for a delivery and want to make sure it's there on time, no problem. Just say, show me driveway camera to check on it with your Home Life HD cameras on the TV screen while you go about your day. When you live in a home powered by Cox Internet, you can stay connected to what matters and let Cox take care of the rest. To learn more about all the benefits of your connected home, visit cox.com slash this is home today. Hi everyone, it's Rose Parker, and today we have another guest on the podcast, the one and only Cecilia McGow, founder of Students with Psychosis. Now, you all might be familiar with Students with Psychosis, either from your own involvement with it, it, its prominence in the psychosis community, or from my page. You might know that I currently serve on the executive board as Students with Psychosis as of this podcast but I don't know how much you know about Cecilia. Cecilia has a very interesting life story and story when it comes to her founding students with psychosis. She's gone through a lot, and she and I also have a very close friendship, and I'd love for you to just get to know her more and this organization that means so much to me. So Cecilia, would you like to get us started? First, say thank you so much, Rose, for having me on. And you're such a dear friend, and also such a powerhouse advocate uh, within the psychosis community. I just have the largest respect for you. Thank you, thank you. Cecilia. And li likewise, I so admire what you do, and I'm so proud to call you my friend and to work for you. Well, right back at you. So let's go a bit at the beginning. Can you tell us a bit about your journey with psychosis, how you learned you had psychosis, and what got you started in all of this? Yeah, so it's been thought of that I've had uh, psychosis symptoms for, well, for as long as I can remember. Uh, when I was younger, I used to see shadowy figures, one in particular that would like come out of uh, my closet and my parents would call it Mr. Blob Man. Uh, they just, I honestly think that they thought that I just had an overactive imagination. I mean, to be quite honest, what five-year-old isn't scared of their uh, bedroom closet? But my symptoms progressed as I got older, started having more of staticky whispers in my ears. And then the hallucinations that were shadowy figures ended up morphing more into uh, much more vivid uh, hallucinations. And during my junior and senior year of high school, I started seeing some of my more recurring hallucinations, such as a clown that very much resembles the older adaptation of Stephen King Bit, spiders, uh, a, a uh, ghost-like girl, and. Um, some other reoccurring hallucinations as well. And these hallucinations got worse and really snowballed into uh, college. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, receive any treatment until eight months after a suicide attempt my freshman year at college. Um, and partially because why I didn't receive treatment was because of stigma both internal stigma and also pushback that I received from my family members. I remember talking to my mom, my mom saying that don't tell anyone about uh, your hallucination, what you're, what you're uh, experiencing because people are going to think that you're crazy, people are going to think that you're dangerous and you won't be able to get a job. Uh, so my message uh, to that now is that if anyone listening to this podcast and your debating whether or not to get uh, treatment because of the stigma. I just want to say that it is your choice and it is also your right. Don't let anyone, including yourself, uh, get in the way of getting that proper medical treatment. And it was from this experience of having uh, psychosis and struggling 
uh, I realized that a lot of individuals, my fellow peers, were falling through the cracks uh, at, at the university. Um, and this very much uh, bothered me. And however, I wasn't yet open about my psychosis until my second hospital stay because the police were involved. I'll set up the scene a, a little bit. Uh, the night before, I was struggling with my psychosis symptoms. I checked myself into the ER. I stayed there overnight. All was good. The doctor said I was okay to go back to my uh, dorm room. Uh, but when I returned back to my dorm room, I was not only greeted by my three roommates, but also the RA and a can help person. And we all talked and decided that I need another psych ward stay and I was in no way refuting to go and I have no past history of violence. Uh, actually, uh, I lived in a, a domestic abuse shelter for part of high school. And so I was in no way refusing to go and I wasn't a threat, uh, but they found it necessary to call the police and they brought in police officers in full uniform into my dorm room. They patted me down and escorted me into a marked uh, police uh, car in front of the dining commons. And then I was gone for 10 days. And when I got back, the cat was out of the bag. And that's when I wanted to make sure to set the story straight. And I started my advocacy. And from that, then I also started the nonprofit Students with Psychosis. Oh, that's a really powerful story you share about how the, sti the stigma against psychosis and how we are often treated like criminals and like we are perpetrators when in fact we are medical patients. We are people suffering from an organic brain condition and instead of being treated like people with an illness, we are treated like deviants and people that must be controlled and your story um, really hit, hits me. Um, personally, when I have had psychotic episodes, I have been escorted to the hospital by police, but never in such a public um, demeaning manner. And honestly, that is just so incredibly appalling. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you, but I am glad that you had that resiliency factor and you took it as a, as a, st as a step to make change and to, and to move forward so it wouldn't happen to another person. And isn't that why we do all of this anyway? So and that's one thing I love about you. You take the negatives and you turn them into ways to protect other people and prevent harm from happening to other people in the future that I hold a similar attitude, at least I try to. And I think that's one reason we get along so well. We both have this fighting attitude and I hope it's one thing we can build in this community that we need to push forward. We need to change it for the future. It's not enough to just say things are wrong. We need to actually change how things are handled. I cannot agree with you more and echoing what you said that uh, we need to help uh, create change on how uh, people with psychosis are treated uh, when they're in a mental health crisis and also how they're treated in general as well. I know as someone with psychosis, oftentimes my valid fears are dismissed as paranoia, and then my also valid ambitions are often dismissed as like delusions of grandeur and such. I remember in college uh, when I was making the shift uh, with my uh, career trajectory, I was a radio astronomer uh, for seven years, and after this incident with the police, I decided to go more the direction of mental health advocacy and, and starting a nonprofit. And I remember talking with uh, my uh, mental health care uh, provider at the time. And when I spoke about my ambitions of moving to New York City, founding a nonprofit, those were very much dismissed as like a delusion of grandeur. Let me just say, I do kind of understand, you know, if someone 
you know, expresses like giving up their career and moving to New York City, that does maybe sound, you know, like an extreme move or something, but people with psychosis can dream big, you know? And I, I think that we very much as a society need to rethink how we uh, see people living with psychosis and the things that they can accomplish in their life. For me, I was, I was working in molecular biology and I was basically told, you're never going to graduate college, you're going to end up in an institution, or you're going to die. And, you know, I, I didn't end up being a molecular biologist, but look what's happened. And I, I proved all of them wrong. And I just, it, it feels so good. And I, I really get what you're saying, because we're either dismissed as delusional or we're told we'll end up in a hospital for the rest of our lives. And there's just no hope surrounding people with psych psychosis in the general cultural narrative. And we need to change that because we have so few role models like ourselves and it's just, we're not hopeless and, and our ambitions are not delusions. It is possible for people with psychosis to live happy, fulfilling lives. Most of the obstacles are cultural and institutional, and those can be changed. I cannot agree more. A lot of the obstacles being uh, created by uh, society, like what you you have said, and to be very honest, when it comes to creating workplace environments, school environments, social environments that are mental health friendly and neurodivergent, everyone wins, whether or not you have a, a, a mental health condition or not. Uh, it, we really need to be moving more towards that uh, direction to be more accommodating, more accessible to people in general, and this would very much help empower people living with psychosis. Agreed. Agreed. Just a more accommodating environment in general will help everyone. I remember when I was reading articles for, for my article, article on students with psychosis in higher education, the, the one that's available on my, I, on my blog and is getting published in short form. Um, having, having a mental health or, or, or neurodivergence is a bigger factor in not graduating college than being first generation racial minority or low social economic status you're more likely not to graduate if you have a mental health issue than any of those those factors and in some some study studies cohort a cohort study no one with early onset schizophrenia achieved a tertiary degree and this was a huge cohort cohort study in finland of the late 20th century so it just shows how many ob obstacles there are but there are people who, who do make it there's ellen sachs there's mr o'grady who i interviewed on my last interview podcast and i graduated college it is possible but the problem is the institutions and we have students here and students with psychosis who are willing willing to study, who want to study, who want tertiary degrees, who want graduate degrees, who want PhDs and MDs and things like that. But we have to let them. I cannot agree more. And also when it comes to like the importance of having organizations like Students with Psychosis, just adding on to your point, there are so many additional barriers for people living with psychosis in uh, when when going uh, working towards a academic degree and when it comes to students with psychosis that's something that i'm very proud of the work that we do we offer over 28 hours worth of virtual programming for our students every single week uh, and during uh, even during uh the covid actually our 
uh, when it came to our reach, our outreach, we ended up expanding so much because we had to meet the demand of students abruptly leaving their universities and the increased need of mental health care. I remember before COVID, uh, we had just started accepting uh, students outside of Penn State. We started out as a little club at Penn State called Students with Schizophrenia. Then we rebranded to Students with Psychosis uh, in January of 2020 to be more inclusive. And then, uh, then COVID happened in March 2020. And by April, our student leader uh, program had grown by 20%. And now we're in over 31 uh, countries around the world. And something that I think is so important and powerful with our organization, Students with Psychosis, is that we help create a global dialogue about psychosis, a global perspective of psychosis, because there is no one size fits all solution when it comes to empowering people with psychosis. Uh, and this includes uh, when it comes to approaches in education as well. And I'm very proud of our organization to creating that environment for our students. Me too. I, I, I've never been prouder to be part of an organization. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like going from a student at Penn, Penn State, State, an astronomy student, to, to founding students with psychosis in New York City. Yeah, uh, so it was definitely quite an adjustment uh, because. Sorry guys, we had a glitch there. Cecilia, go back to talking about going to uh, Penn State to New York. Once again, sorry guys. No worries, no worries. Uh, so when it came to adjusting to the shift from being an astronomy and astrophysics student at Penn State and then moving to New York City to get the nonprofit Students with Psychosis off the ground, there were a lot of different uh, shifts that happened in my uh, personal and mental health uh, journey. For example, Penn State was in the middle of Pennsylvania in a college town, uh, which felt very safe and familiar to me. And also there was a lot of routine and also I was lucky enough to be at a university that had quite a lot of uh, different accommodations to help me when it came to my academic journey. So taking that and moving to New York was quite an adjustment to make. Uh, as someone who has schizophrenia, and also I'm autistic, moving to New York was at first a lot of sensory overload for me, uh, to a point that I often found myself sitting in Times Square and as exposure therapy, uh, for me, that person helped me a lot uh, to sort of get used to the crowds. Um, also, I had a bit of a culture shock um, because in, the, in New York, the homeless population is a lot more prevalent. And also you see uh, individuals ha experiencing what might be uh, psychosis symptoms much more uh, uh, out in the open than what you might, uh, s compared to what you might see in a smaller town. And for me, this very much hurt my heart a lot uh, because it's, I, I think of how easy it could have been for me to have fallen through the cracks uh, if I didn't have a support system from the university and friends to lean on. So these were some adjustments on a personal level from moving from uh, State College to New York. And I didn't make a, an abrupt move. There were six months that I would take the bus for five and a half hours, drive to New York, stay there for like a day or two, and then go back to uh, State College. And I did that back and forth once a week for six months, uh, just to network and start to those connections in New York before I made that final move. Uh, and then when it comes to the entrepreneur journey, I think there needs to be a lot more awareness uh, when it comes to talking about mental health and entrepreneur culture, because 
oftentimes uh, when we talk about like entrepreneurship, uh, there's sometimes this unhealthy work-life balance uh, connotation that comes with it. Like you have to do the grind, uh, you have to pull all these all-nighters or, uh, you know, the like quotation, sleep when you're dead type of thing. And that can be very, very unhealthy. Um, and starting a, any type of business or nonprofit off the ground, you know, is very stressful. And I think that there needs to be more awareness again for healthy work life balance culture when it comes to entrepreneurship and also when it comes to resources that an entrepreneur living with a mental health condition can reach out to for assistance. Those are some things that I want to highlight more. Very interesting. Um, so what, so can you go into a bit more about once you got to New York City, how did you go about setting up students, students with psychosis and building it into the uh, online organization it is? How did you find the advocates? that that you built the organization with like i remember you reached out to me on instagram and that's how we connected and started building our relationship how how did you find the advocates like just i'm kind of curious yeah yeah so oh wow we connected i think was it back in january of 2020 it was right before new year's right before new year so so like december 2019 Oh my goodness, uh, we've been friends for a while. We've been quite a journey, haven't we, Rose? It really has been. <laughs> it has. Um, so when it comes to connecting uh, with other powerhouse uh, advocates out there and finding also our powerhouse uh, student leaders, um, quite a few different avenues are that are coming together to create this community that we built. Uh, some of it is from Instagram. I saw your posts on Instagram because I follow, you know, the relevant hashtags uh, within our psychosis community and I kept on seeing your posts coming up and I'm like, wow, these are very informative posts. These are right on and really resonate with the, the vision and values that uh, students with psychosis foster. So I reached out to you and I'm so flattered that you thought back, <laughs> you know, you answered back and such and we, we connected there. Um, and so that's one type of way that uh, finding uh, like minds to start the nonprofit, reaching yeah. out on uh, social media. Uh, I'll tell you a secret. Oh, what? I'd been following, I'd been following Swiss, Swiss psychosis, psychosis for a couple for months, a couple months, months at, that point, at that point and I'd been and wanting I'd to get it. Get Involved. involved. I'd have been following, been following you, you, too, you too, and I'd been hoping I could get in contact contact with you. Oh, well, I'm I'm so flattered flattered to hear that. And you know what? It's like it, it it works out so well. And I think that's because we have very similar um, um, mindset when it comes to uh, vision and values, and also that passion and love on trying to help our community move forward and to empower the psychosis community. So I think that's why when we connected, we resonated so well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, have we have very similar background, very background. And, we very and, similar and we have very similar values, values and, goals and goals and disability, and philosophy. disability philosophy. Agreed, agreed. And when it came to also recruiting and part of why like students with psychosis have grown uh, so much, uh, in uh, 2020 alone, students with psychosis have reached over 500 students around the globe. And again, this is from an organization where we were just a club at Penn State in, in expanding. We, our first year expanding out of Penn State was the 2019-2020 school year. Let me just say, what a school year to, ex to start expanding. We got quite the, <laughs> <laughs> quite the surprise in the second act there. Uh, but I'm proud of how we again adapted and really stepped up uh, when it came to meeting the demand and need uh, from uh, students reaching out. Uh, also something that helped with our recruitment is we've been very fortunate to have quite a, uh, a lot of collaborative 
videos that have gone viral on YouTube, uh, such as uh, the introduction of the idea of starting students with psychosis uh, came from the TEDx PSU talk uh, that has received over 5 million views on uh, YouTube and also other collaborations, notably such as with special books by special kids and Anthony Padilla. And then we were recently in a PBS documentary. So those are other ways that we've helped to get the word out about students with psychosis and it's helped with our recruitment. Very, very interesting. Yeah, we've been very blessed to have some good partnerships as an organization. Um, so let's talk. What are what are we doing looking forward? What are some things you want people to know about goals for students with psychosis? What what are some what what would you like to encourage them? in terms of if, if you want them to join the organization, do you want to, would you like to put in any sort of donation plug and any sort of final thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So looking to the future with students with psychosis. So we're very much excited to be starting our in-person programming again uh, in this fall. Uh, so we've again expanded quite a lot uh, throughout uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, due to expanding virtually on our virtual programs. So we are going to be then starting up our college clubs, affiliates, and hubs again this fall, which I'm extremely excited about. Uh, also, another thing that's very exciting coming up in November, November 6th, is our Rethink uh, Conference, uh, where we will be having the dialogue about people living with psychosis, trying to change that narrative but also a celebration for our community. So that's gonna be happening here in New York, November 6th. Awesome, yeah, we are really looking forward to Rethink. And also, Rethink will have a virtual option, which I will be participating in because I am not well enough to travel and I will be in graduate school while Rethink is going on. So the Rethink, the virtual option is a legitimate is a legitimate option. You will still have a, a full experience of the conference. So don't write that off if you are interested in the conference, but unable or uninterested in traveling to New York. Thank you so much for noting that. Yes, we will make sure to have that virtual option there. And I am so excited uh, for Rethink. And wow, I, again, I'm just very, very proud of the organization uh, that we built. And I just want to also say thank you, Rose, for really being one of those powerhouses behind the scenes in getting this movement to where it is today. Yeah, I am so proud of what we have done. I am excited for our future. This this is my life. Um, I hope that we that you and I can continue to work together and serve this community for many happy years to come. I'm in it for the long haul with you, Rose. <laughs> together till the end. <laughs> Well, anyway, that's that's our show for tonight, and I'll and we'll talk to you all later. Bye. Bye. Cox can help make your home smarter and your life easier. Now you can use your Contour Voice Remote to connect to your home life cameras, so you can view them right on your TV screen using simple voice commands. That makes it easy to keep tabs on what's happening around your home right from your couch. Need to keep an eye on the kids when they're playing outside? Just say, show me my backyard camera into your Cox voice remote and watch them while you're in the house. And if you're waiting for a delivery and want to make sure it's there on time, no problem. Just say, show me driveway camera to check on it with your Home Life HD cameras on the TV screen while you go about your day. When you live in a home powered by Cox Internet, you can stay connected to what matters and let Cox take care of the rest. To learn more about all the benefits of your connected home, visit cox.com slash thisishome today. Cox can help make your home smarter and your life easier. Now you can use your Contour voice remote to connect to your home life cameras so you can view them right on your TV screen using simple voice commands. That makes it easy to keep tabs on what's happening around your home right from your couch. 
Need to keep an eye on the kids when they're playing outside? Just say, show me my backyard camera into your Cox voice remote and watch them while you're in the house. And if you're waiting for a delivery and want to make sure it's there on time, no problem. Just say, show me driveway camera to check on it with your Home Life HD cameras on the TV screen while you go about your day. When you live in a home powered by Cox Internet, you can stay connected to what matters and let Cox take care of the rest. To learn more about all the benefits of your connected home, visit cox.com slash thisishome today.